Act One of The Impostures of Scapin by Moliere, translated by Charles Heron Wall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personi Argant, father to Octave and Zerbinet, read by Todd. Geront, father to Leander and Hyacintha, read by Tavarish. Octave, son to Argent and lover to Hyacintha, read by Thomas Peter. Leander, son to Geront, lover of Zerbinet, read by Asher Gravi. Zerbinet, daughter to Argant, believed to be a gypsy girl, read by Avai. Hyacintha, daughter to Geront, read by Leanne Yao. Scapin, servant to Leandre, read by Sonia. Sylvester, servant to Octave, read by Lurie Wilson. Nerin, nurse to Hyacintha, read by T.J. Burns. Carl, read by Alan Mapstone. Stage directions, read by Sandra Schmidt the scene is at naples the impostures of scapin act one scene one octave sylvestre ah oh, what sad news for one in love what a hard fate to be reduced to so sylvestre you have just heard at the harbour that my father is coming back yes that he returns this very morning this very morning with the intention of marrying me of marrying you to a daughter of monsieur Geront, of mr Geront, and that this daughter is on her way from tarentum for that purpose for that purpose and you have this news from my uncle from your uncle to whom my father has given all these particulars in a letter in a letter and this uncle you say knows all about our doings all our doings oh speak i pray you don't go on in such a way as that and force me to wrench everything from you word by word but what is the use of my speaking you don't forget one single detail but state everything exactly as it is at least advise me and tell me what i ought to do in this wretched business i really feel as much perplexed as you and i myself need the advice of someone to guide me i am undone by this unforeseen return and i no less when my father hears what has taken place a storm of reprimands will burst upon me reprimands are not very heavy to bear would to heaven i were free at that price but i am very likely to pay dearly for all your wild doings and i see a storm of blows ready to burst upon my shoulders heavens how am i to get clear of all the difficulties that beset my path you should have thought of that before entering upon it oh don't come and plague me to death with your unreasonable lectures you plague me much more by your foolish deeds what am i to do what steps must i take to what course of action have recourse scene two octave scapin sylvestre how now mr octave what is the matter with you what is it what troubles are you in you are all upset i see ah my dear scapin i am in despair i am lost i am the most unfortunate of mortals how's that don't you know anything of what has happened to me no my father is just returning with monsieur Geron, and they want to marry me <laughs> well what is there so dreadful about that alas you don't know what cause i have to be anxious no but it only depends on you that i should know soon and i am a man of consolation 
a man who can interest himself in the troubles of young people ah scapa if you could find some scheme invent some plot to get me out of the trouble i am in i should think myself indebted to you for more than life oh to tell you the truth there are few things impossible to me when i once set about them heaven has bestowed on me a fair enough share of genius for the making up of all those neat strokes of mother wit for all those ingenious gallantries to which the ignorant and vulgar give the name of impostures and i can boast without vanity that there have been very few men more skilful than i in expedients and intrigues and who have acquired a greater reputation in the noble profession but to tell the truth merit is too ill-rewarded nowadays and i have given up everything of the kind since the trouble i had through a certain affair which happened to me how what affair skipper oh an adventure in which justice and i fell out justice and you yes we had a trifling quarrel you and justice yes she used me very badly and i felt so enraged against the ingratitude of our age that i determined never to do anything for anybody but never mind tell me about yourself all the same you know scapin that two months ago monsieur jarron and my father set out together on a voyage about a certain business in which they are both interested yes i know that and that both leandre and i were left by our respective fathers i under the management of sylvestre and leandre under your management yes i have acquitted myself very well of my charge some time afterwards leandre met with a young gypsy girl with whom he fell in love i know that too as we are great friends he told me at once of his love and took me to see this young girl whom i thought good-looking it is true but not so beautiful as he would have had me believe he never spoke of anything but her at every opportunity he exaggerated her grace and her beauty extolled her intelligence spoke to me with transport of the charms of her conversation and related to me her most insignificant saying which he always wanted me to think the cleverest thing in the world he often found fault with me for not thinking as highly as he imagined i ought to do of the things he related to me and blamed me again and again for being so insensible to the power of love i do not see what you are aiming at in all this one day as i was going with him to the people who have charge of the girl with whom he is in love we heard in a small house on a by-street lamentations mixed with a good deal of sobbing we inquired what it was and were told by a woman that we might see there a most piteous sight in the persons of two strangers and that unless we were quite insensible to pity we should be sure to be touched with it where will this lead to curiosity made me urge leandre to come in with me we went into a low room where we saw an old woman dying and with her a servant who was uttering lamentations and a young girl dissolved in tears the most beautiful the most touching sight that you ever saw uh oh any other person would have seemed frightful in the condition she was in for all the dress she had on was a scanty old petticoat with a night jacket of plain fustian and turned back at the top of her head a yellow cap which let her hair fall in disorder on her shoulders and yet dressed even thus she shone with a thousand attractions and all her person was most charming and pleasant <laughs> i begin to understand had you but seen her scapa as i did you would have thought her admirable oh i have no doubt about it and without seeing her i plainly perceived that she must have been altogether charming her tears were none of those unpleasant tears which spoil the face she had a most touching grace in weeping 
and her sorrow was a most beautiful thing to witness. I can see all that. All who approached her burst into tears whilst she threw herself in her loving way on the body of the dying woman, whom she called her dear mother, and nobody could help being moved to the depths of the heart to see a girl with such a loving disposition. Yes, all that is very touching, and I understand that this loving disposition made you love her. Ah, oh, Scapa, a savage would have loved her. Certainly. How could anyone help doing so? After a few words with which I tried to soothe her grief, we left her, and when I asked Leandre what he thought of her, he answered coldly that she was rather pretty. I was wounded to find how unfeelingly he spoke to me of her, and I would not tell him the effect her beauty had had on my heart. Silvestre to Octave if you do not abridge your story, you shall have to stop here till tomorrow. Leave it to me to finish it in a few words. To Scapin? His heart takes fire from that moment. He cannot live without going to comfort the amiable and sorrowful girl. His frequent visits are forbidden by the servant, who has become her guardian by the death of the mother. Our young man is in despair. He presses, begs, beseeches all in vain he is told that the young girl although without friends and without fortune is of an honourable family and that unless he marries her he must cease his visits his love increases with the difficulties he racks his brains debates reasons ponders and makes up his mind and to cut a long story short he has been married these three days i see now add to this the unforeseen return of the father, who was not to be back before two whole months, the discovery which the uncle has made of the marriage, and that other marriage projected between him and a daughter which Mr. Jean had by a second wife, whom they say he married at Tarentum. And above all, add also the poverty of my beloved, and the impossibility there is for me to do anything for her relief. Is that all? You are, both of you, at a great loss about nothing. Is there any reason to be alarmed? Are you not ashamed, you, Silvestre, to fall short in such a small matter? <laughs> Deuce take it all. You, big and stout as father and mother put together, you can't find any expedient in your noddle? You can't plan any stratagem? Invent any gallant intrigue to put matters straight? <laughs> Fie! Plague on the booby! I wish I had had the two old fellows to bamboozle in former times. I should not have thought much of it. And I was no bigger than that when I had given a hundred delicate proofs of my skill. I acknowledge that heaven has not given me your talent and that I have not the brains like you to embroil myself with justice. Here is my lovely Hyacintha. Scene 3. Hyacintha, Octave, Scapin, Silvestre. Ah! Octave, is what Silvestre has told Noreen really true? Is your father back, and is he bent upon marrying you? Yes, it is so, dear Hyacintha, and these tidings have given me a cruel shock. But what do I see? You are weeping. Why those tears? Do you suspect me of unfaithfulness, and have you no assurance of the love I feel for you? Yes, Octave. I am sure that you love me now. But can I be sure that you will love me always? Ah! Oh, could anyone love you once without loving you forever? I have heard say, Octave, that your sex does not love so long as ours, and that the ardour men show is a fire which dies out as easily as it is kindled. Then, my dear Hyacintha, my heart is not like that of other men, and I feel certain that I shall love you till I die. I want to believe what you say, and I have no doubt that you are sincere, but I fear a power which will oppose in your heart the tender feelings you have for me. You depend on a father who would marry you to another, and I am sure it would kill me if such a thing happened. No, lovely Hyacintha, there is no father who can force me to break my faith to you, 
and I could resolve to leave my country, and even to die rather than be separated from you. Without having seen her, I have already conceived a horrible aversion to her whom they want me to marry. And although I am not cruel, I wish the sea would swallow her up, or drive her hence forever. Do not weep then, dear Hyacinta, for your tears kill me, and I cannot see them without feeling pierced to the heart. Oh, since you wish it, I will dry my tears, and I will wait without fear for what heaven shall decide. Heaven will be favourable to us. It cannot be against us, if you are faithful. I certainly shall be so. Then I shall be happy. Scapin, aside, hmm, she is not so bad after all, and I think her pretty enough. Octave, showing Scapin, here is a man who, if he would, could be of the greatest help to us in all our trouble. I have sworn with many oaths never more to meddle with anything. But if you both entreat me very much, I might... Ah, if entreaties will obtain your help, I beseech you with all my heart to steer our bark. Scapin to Hyacinta. And you? Have you anything to say? Like him, I beseech you, by all that is most dear to you upon earth, to assist us in our love. <sighs> I must have a little humanity and give way. There, don't be afraid. I will do all I can for you. Be sure that. Hush. To Hyacinta. Go and make yourself easy. Scene 4 Octave, Scapin, Sylvestre Scapin to Octave You must prepare yourself to receive your father with firmness. I confess that this meeting frightens me beforehand, for with him I have a natural shyness that I cannot conquer. Yes, you must be firm from the first, for fear that he should take advantage of your weakness and lead you like a child. Now come. Try to school yourself into some amount of firmness and be ready to answer boldly all he can say to you. I will do the best I can. <laughs> well, let us try a little, just to see. Rehearse your part and let us see how you will manage. Come, a look of decision. Your head erect, a bold face. Like this. Uh, a little more. So? That will do. Now, fancy that I am your father, just arrived. Answer me boldly, as if it were he himself. What? You scoundrel! You good-for-nothing fellow! You infamous rascal! Unworthy son of such a father as I! Dare you appear before me after what you have done? And after the infamous trick you have played me during my absence? Is this, you rascal, the reward of all my care? Is this the fruit of all my devotion? Is this the respect due to me? Is this the respect you retain for me? Now then, now then. You are insolent enough, scoundrel to go and engage yourself without the consent of your father and contract a clandestine marriage. Answer me, you villain. Answer me. Let me hear your fine reasons. Why the deuce? You seem quite lost. It, it is because I imagine I hear my father speaking. <laughs> Why, yes. And it is for this reason that you must try not to look like an idiot. I will be more resolute, and will answer more firmly. Quite sure. Here is your father coming. Oh, heavens, I am lost. Scene 5. Scapin, Sylvestre. Stop, Octave, stop. Oh, he's off. What a poor specimen it is. Let's wait for the old man all the same. What shall I tell him? Leave him to me. Only follow me. 
scene six argand scapin sylvestre at the further part of the stage argand thinking himself alone did any one ever hear of such an action scapin to sylvestre he has already heard of the affair and is so struck by it that although alone he speaks aloud about it argand thinking himself alone such a bold thing to do let us listen to him i should like to know what they can say to me about this fine marriage <laughs> we have it already will they try to deny it no we have no thought of doing so or will they undertake to excuse it that may be do they intend to deceive me with impertinent stories maybe all they can say will be useless <laughs> we shall see they will not take me in i don't know that i shall know how to put my rascal of a son in a safe place <laughs> we shall see about that and as for that rascal sylvester i will cudgel him soundly sylvester to scapin i should have been very much astonished if he had forgotten me argand seeing sylvester ah here you are most wise governor of a family fine director of young people sir i am delighted to see you back good morning scapin to sylvester you have really followed my orders in a fine manner and my son has behaved splendidly you are quite well i see pretty well to sylvester you don't say a word you rascal have you had a pleasant journey yes yes very good leave me alone a little to scold this villain you want to scold yes i wish to scold but whom sir argand pointing to sylvester this scoundrel why have you not heard what has taken place during my absence yes i have heard some trifling thing oh some trifling thing such an action as this you are about right such a daring thing to do that's quite true to marry without his father's consent yes there is something to be said against it but my opinion is that you should make no fuss about it this is your opinion but not mine and i will make as much fuss as i please what do you not think i have every reason to be angry quite so i was angry myself when i first heard it and i so far felt interested in your behalf that i rated your son well just ask him the fine sermons i gave him and how i lectured him about the little respect he showed his father whose very footsteps he ought to kiss oh, you could not yourself talk better to him but what of that i submitted to reason and considered that after all he had done nothing so dreadful what are you telling me he has done nothing so dreadful when he goes and marries straight off a perfect stranger what can one do he was urged to it by his destiny oh ho. you give me there a fine reason one has nothing better to do now than to commit the greatest crime imaginable to cheat steal and murder and give for an excuse that we were urged to it by our destiny ah me you take my words too much like a philosopher i mean to say that he was fatally engaged in this affair and why did he engage in it do you expect him to be as wise as you are can you put an old head on young shoulders and expect young people to have all the prudence necessary to do nothing but what is reasonable just look at our leandre who in spite of all my lessons has done even worse than that i should like to know whether you yourself were not young ones and have not played as many pranks as others i have heard say that you were a sad fellow in your time 
that you played the gallant among the most gallant of those days and that you never gave in until you had gained your point it is true i grant it but i always confined myself to gallantry and never went so far as to do what he has done but what was he to do he sees a young person who wishes him well for he inherits it from you that all women love him he thinks her charming goes to see her makes love to her sighs as lovers sigh and does the passionate swain she yields to his pressing visits he pushes his fortune <sighs> but her relations catch him with her and oblige him to marry her by main force Silvestre aside what a clever cheat would you have him suffer them to murder him it is still better to be married than to be dead i was not told that the thing had happened in that way scapin showing Silvestre, ask him if you like he will tell you the same thing argant to Silvestre, was he married against his wish yes sir do you think i would tell you an untruth then he should have gone at once to a lawyer to protest against the violence oh it is the very thing he would not do it would have made it easier for me to break off the marriage break off the marriage yes <laughs> you will not break it off i shall not break it off no what have i not on my side the rights of a father and can i not have satisfaction for the violence done to my son this is a thing he will not consent to he will not consent to it no my son your son would you have him acknowledge that he was frightened and that he yielded by force to what was wanted of him he will take care not to confess that it would be to wrong himself and show himself unworthy of a father like you i don't care for all that he must for his own honour and yours say that he married of his own free will and i wish for my own honour and for his that he should say the contrary i am sure he will not do that i shall soon make him do it he will not acknowledge it i tell you he shall do it or i will disinherit him you i <laughs> nonsense how nonsense you will not disinherit him i shall not disinherit him no 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 well this is really too much i shall not disinherit my son no i tell you who will hinder me you yourself i yes you will never have the heart to do it i shall have the heart <laughs> you are joking i am not joking paternal love will carry the day no it will not yes yes i tell you that i will disinherit him <laughs> rubbish you may say rubbish but i will gracious me i know that you are naturally a kind-hearted man no i am not kind-hearted i can be angry when i choose leave off talking you put me out of all patience to Silvestre, go you rascal run and fetch my son while i go to mr durant and tell him of my misfortune sir if i can be useful to you in any way you have but to order me i thank you aside ah why is he my only son oh that i had with me the daughter that heaven has taken away from me so that i might make her my heir scene seven scapin sylvestre you are a great man i must confess and things are in a fair way to succeed but on the other hand we are greatly pressed for money and we have people dunning us leave it to me 
the plan is all ready i am only puzzling my brains to find out a fellow to act along with us in order to play a personage i want but let me see just look at me a little stick your cap rather rakishly on one side put on a furious look put your hand on your side walk about like a king on the stage oh, that will do follow me i possess some means of changing your face and voice i pray you scapin don't go and embroil me with justice never mind we will share our perils like brothers and three years more or less on the galleys are not sufficient to check a noble heart End of Act One Act Two of The Impostures of Scapin by Moliere Translated by Charles Heron Wall This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Act Two Scene One Gironde, Argante yes there is no doubt but that with this weather we shall have our people with us to-day and a sailor who has arrived from tarentum told me just now that he had seen our man about to start with the ship but my daughter's arrival will find things strangely altered from what we thought they would be and what you have just told me of your son has put an end to all the plans we had made together. Don't be anxious about that. I give you my word that I shall remove that obstacle, and I am going to see about it this moment. In all good faith, Mr. Argant, shall I tell you what? The education of children is a thing that one could never be too careful about. You are right. But why do you say that? Because most of the follies of young men come from the way they have been brought up by their fathers. It is so sometimes, certainly. But what do you mean by saying that to me? Why do I say that to you? Yes. Because, if, like a courageous father, you had corrected your son when he was young, he would not have played you such a trick. I see. So that you have corrected your own much better. Certainly. And I should be very sorry if he had done anything at all like what yours has done. And if that son, so well brought up, had done worse even than mine, what would you say? What? What? What do you mean? I mean, Monsieur Geronte, that we should never be so ready to blame the conduct of others, and that those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. I really do not understand you. I will explain myself. Have you heard anything about my son? Perhaps I have. But what? Your servant, Scapin, in his vexation, only told me the thing roughly and you can learn all the particulars from him or from someone else for my part i will at once go to my solicitor and see what steps i can take in the matter good-bye scene two Gérante alone what can it be worse than what his son has done i am sure i don't know what any one can do more wrong than that and to marry without the consent of one's father is the worst thing that I can possibly imagine. Scene 3. Gironde, Léandre. Ah, here you are. Léandre, going quickly towards his father to embrace him. Ah, father, how glad I am to see you. Gironde, refusing to embrace him stay i have to speak to you first allow me to embrace you and Gérante refusing him again gently i tell you how 
Father, you deprived me of the pleasure of showing you my joy at your return. Certainly. We have something to settle first of all. But what? Just stand there before me and let me look at you. What for? Look me straight in the face. Well? Will you tell me what has taken place here in my absence? What has taken place? Yes. What did you do while I was away? What would you have me do, father? It is not I who wanted you to do anything, but who ask you now what it is you did. <laughs> I have done nothing to give you reason to complain. Nothing at all? No. You speak in a very decided tone. It is because I am innocent. And yet Scapin has told me all about you. Scapin? Ha, ha! That name makes you change color. He has told you something about me? He has. But it is not a place to talk about the business, and we must go elsewhere to see to it. Go home at once. I will be there presently. Ah, scoundrel, if you mean to bring dishonor upon me, I will renounce you for my son, and you will have to avoid my presence for ever. Scene 4. Leandre alone. To betray me after that fashion. A rascal who for so many reasons should be the first to keep secret what I trust him with. To go and tell everything to my father. Ah, I swear by all that is dear to me not to let such villainy go unpunished. Scene 5. Octave, Leandre, Scapin. My dear Scapin, what do I not owe to you? What a wonderful man you are, and how kind of heaven to send you to my hell. Ah, ah, here you are, you rascal. Sir, your servant, you do me too much honor. Leandre, drawing his sword. You are setting me at defiance, I believe. Ah, I will teach you how. Scapin, falling on his knees. Sir? Octave, stepping between them. Ah, Leandre. No, Octave, do not keep me back. Scapin to Leandre. Eh, sir? Octave, keeping back Leandre. For mercy's sake. Leandre, trying to strike. Leave me to wreck my anger upon him. In the name of our friendship, Leandre, do not strike him. What have I done to you, sir? What you have done, you scoundrel. Octave, still keeping back Leandre. Gently, gently. No, Octave, I will have him confess here, on the spot, the perfidy of which he is guilty. Yes, scoundrel, I know the trick you have played me. I have just been told of it. You did not think the secret would be revealed to me, did you? But I will have you confess it with your own lips, or I will run you through and through with my sword. Ah, oh, sir, could you really be so cruel as that? Speak, I say. I have done something against you, sir? Yes, scoundrel, and your conscience must tell you only too well what it is. I assure you that I do not know what you mean. Leandre, going towards Scapin to strike him. You do not know? Octave, keeping back Leandre. Leandre! Well, sir, since you will have it, I confess that I drank with some of my friends that small cask of Spanish wine you received as a present some days ago, and that it was I who made that opening in the cask and spilled some water on the ground around it to make you believe that all the wine had leaked out. <laughs> what? Scoundrel, it was you who drank my Spanish wine and who suffered me to scold the servant so much because I thought it was she who had played me that trick? Yes, sir. I'm very sorry, sir. I am glad to know this, but this is not what I am about now. It is not that, sir? No, 
It is something else, for which I care much more, and I will have you tell it to me. I do not remember, sir, that I ever did anything else. Leandre, trying to strike Scapin. Will you speak? No. Ah. Octave, keeping back Leandre. Gently? Yes, sir. It is true that three weeks ago, when you sent me in the evening to take a small watch to the gypsy girl you love, and I came back, my clothes spattered with mud and my face covered with blood, I told you that I had been attacked by robbers who had beaten me soundly and had stolen the watch from me. It is true that I told a lie. It was I who kept the watch, sir. It was you who stole the watch? Yes, sir in order to know the time ah you are telling me fine things i have indeed a very faithful servant but it is not this that i want to know of you it is not this no infamous wretch it is something else that i want you to confess scapin aside mercy on me speak at once i will not be put off sir I have done nothing else. Leandre, trying to strike Scapin. Nothing else? Octave, stepping between them. Ah, oh, I beg. Well, sir, you remember that ghost that six months ago cudgelled you soundly and almost made you break your neck down a cellar where you fell whilst running away? Well? <laughs> it was I, sir, who was playing the ghost. It was you, wretch, who were playing the ghost? Only to frighten you a little and to cure you of the habit of making us go out every night, as you did. I will remember in proper time and place all I have just heard. But I'll have you speak about the present matter and tell me what it is you said to my father. What I said to your father? yes scoundrel to my father why i have not seen him since his return you have not seen him no sir is that the truth the perfect truth and he shall tell you so himself and yet it was he himself who told me <laughs> with your leave sir he did not tell you the truth scene six leandre octave Carl Scapin. Sir, I bring you very bad news concerning your love affair. What is it now? The gypsies are on the point of carrying off Zebinette. She came herself all in tears to ask me to tell you that unless you take to them before two hours are over the money they have asked you for her she will be lost to you for ever two hours two hours scene seven leandre octave scapin ah my dear scapin i pray you to help me scapin rising and passing proudly before leandre ah my dear scapin i am my dear scapin now that i am wanted I will forgive you all that you confessed just now, and more also. No, no, forgive me nothing. Run your sword through and through my body. I should be perfectly satisfied if you were to kill me. I beseech you rather to give me life by serving my love. Nay, nay, better kill me. You are too dear to me for that. I beg of you to make use for me of that wonderful genius of yours which can conquer everything. Uh, certainly not. Kill me, I tell you. Ah, for mercy's sake. Don't think of that now, but try to give me the help I ask. Scapin, you must do something to help him. How can I after such an abuse? I beseech you to forget my outburst of temper and to make use of your skill for me. I add my entreaties to his. I cannot forget such an insult. You must not give way to resentment, Scapin. Could you forsake me, Scapin, in this cruel extremity? To come all of a sudden and insult me like that? 
I was wrong, I acknowledge. To call me scoundrel, knave, infamous wretch. I am really very sorry. To wish to send your sword through my body. I ask you to forgive me with all my heart, and if you want to see me at your feet, I beseech you, kneeling, not to give me up. Scapin, you cannot resist that. Well, get up. And another time remember not to be so hasty. Will you try to act for me? I will see. But you know that time presses. Oh, don't be anxious. How much is it you want? Five hundred crowns. You? Two hundred pistoles. I must extract this money from your respective father's pockets. To Octave. Mm, as far as yours is concerned, my plan is all ready. To Leandre. And as for yours, although he is the greatest miser imaginable, we shall find it easier still. <laughs> for you know that he is not blessed with too much intellect and i look upon him as a man who will believe anything this cannot offend you there is not a suspicion of a resemblance between him and you and you know what the world thinks that he is your father only in name <laughs> gently scapin besides what does it matter but mr octave i see your father coming let us begin by him since he is the first to cross our path vanish both of you to octave and you please tell sylvester to come quickly and take his part in the affair scene eight argante scapin scapin aside here he is turning it over in his mind argante thinking himself alone such behaviour and such lack of consideration to entangle himself in an engagement like that ah rash youth your servant sir good morning scapin you are thinking of your son's conduct yes i acknowledge that it grieves me deeply ah sir life is full of troubles and we should always be prepared for them i was told a long time ago the saying of an ancient philosopher which i have never forgotten what was it that if the father of a family has been away from home for ever so short a time he ought to dwell upon all the sad news that may greet him on his return he ought to fancy his house burnt down his money stolen his wife dead his son married his daughter ruined and be very thankful for whatever falls short of all this in my small way of philosophy i have ever taken this lesson to heart and i never come home but i expect to have to bear with the anger of my masters their scoldings insults kicks blows and horse-whipping and i always thank my destiny for whatever i do not receive that's all very well but this rash marriage is more than i can put up with and it forces me to break off the match i had intended for my son i have come from my solicitors to see if we can cancel it well sir if you will take my advice you will look to some other way of settling this business you know what a lawsuit means in this country and you'll find yourself in the midst of a strange bush of thorns i am fully aware that you are quite right but what else can i do i think i have found something that will answer much better the sorrow that i felt for you made me rummage in my head to find some means of getting you out of trouble for i cannot bear to see kind fathers a prey to grief without feeling sad about it and besides i have at all times had the greatest regard for you i am much obliged to you then you must know that i went to the brother of the young girl whom your son has married he is one of those fire-eaters one of those men all sword thrusts who speak of nothing but fighting and to think no more of killing a man than of swallowing a glass of wine 
i got him to speak of this marriage i showed him how easy it would be to have it broken off because of the violence used towards your son i spoke to him of your prerogatives as father and of the weight which your rights your money and your friends would have with justice i managed him so that at last he lent a ready ear to the propositions i made to him of arranging the matter amicably for a sum of money in short he will give his consent to the marriage being cancelled provided you pay him well and how much did he ask oh at first things utterly out of the question but what things utterly extravagant but what he spoke of no less than five or six hundred pistoles five or six hundred accused to choke him with all does he think me a fool <laughs> just what i told him i laughed his proposal to scorn and made him understand that you were not a man to be duped in that fashion and of whom any one can ask five or six hundred pistoles however after much talking this is what we decided upon <clears throat> the time is now come he said when i must go and rejoin the army i am buying my equipments and the want of money i am in forces me to listen to what you propose i must have a horse and i cannot obtain one at all fit for the service under sixty pistoles well yes i am willing to give sixty pistoles he must have the harness and pistols and that will cost very nearly twenty pistoles more twenty and sixty make eighty exactly it's a great deal still i consent to that he must also have a horse for his servant which we may expect will cost at least thirty pistoles how the deuce let him go to jericho he shall have nothing at all sir no he's an insolent fellow would you have his servant walk let him get along as he pleases and the master too now sir really don't go and hesitate for so little don't have recourse to law i beg of you but rather give all that is asked of you and save yourself from the clutches of justice well well i will bring myself to give these thirty pistoles also i must also have he said a mule to carry let him go to the devil with his mule this is asking too much we will go before the judges i beg of you sir no i will not give in sir only one small mule no not even an ass consider no i tell you i prefer going to law oh sir what are you talking about and what a resolution you are going to take just cast a glance on the ins and outs of justice look at the number of appeals of stages of jurisdiction how many embarrassing procedures how many ravening wolves through whose claws you will have to pass sergeants solicitors counsel registrars substitutes recorders judges and their clerks there is not one of these who for the merest trifle couldn't knock over the best case in the world a sergeant will issue false writs without your knowing anything of it your solicitor will act in concert with the adversary and sell you for ready money your counsel bribed in the same way will be nowhere to be found when your case comes on or else will bring forward arguments which are the merest shooting in the air and will never come to the point the registrar will issue writs and decrees against you for contumacy the recorder's clerk will make away with some of your papers or the instructing officer himself will not say what he has seen and when by dint of the wariest possible precautions you have escaped all these traps you will be amazed that your judges have been set against you either by bigots 
or by the women they love ha <laughs> ha sir save yourself from such a hell if you can tis damnation in this world to have to go to law and the mere thought of a lawsuit is quite enough to drive me to the other end of the world how much does he want for the mule for the mule for his horse and that of his servant for the harness and pistols and to pay a little something he owes at the hotel he asks altogether two hundred pistoles sir two hundred pistoles yes argant walking about angrily no no we will go to the law recollect what you are doing i shall go to the law don't go and expose yourself to i will go to the law but to go to law you need money you must have money for the summons you must have money for the rolls for prosecution attorney's introduction solicitor's advice evidence and his days in court you must have money for the consultations and pleadings of the counsel for the right of withdrawing the briefs and for engrossed copies of the documents you must have money for the reports of the substitutes for the court fees at the conclusion for registrar's enrolment drawing up of deeds sentences decrees rolls signings and clerk's dispatches letting alone all the presents you will have to make <laughs> give this money to the man and there you are well out of the whole thing two hundred pistoles yes and you will save by it i have made a small calculation in my head of all that justice costs and i find that by giving two hundred pistoles to your man you will have a large margin left say at least a hundred and fifty pistoles without taking into consideration the cares troubles and anxieties which you will spare yourself for were it only to avoid being before everybody the butt of some facetious counsel i had rather give three hundred pistoles than go to law i don't care for that and i challenge all the lawyers to say anything against me you will do as you please but in your place i would avoid a lawsuit i will never give two hundred pistoles ah here is our man scene nine argant scapin sylvestre dressed out as a bravo scapin show me that argant who is the father of octet what for sir i have just been told that he wants to go to law with me and to have my sister's marriage annulled i don't know if such is his intention but he won't consent to give the two hundred pistoles you asked he says it's too much it's death it's blood if i can but find him i'll make mincemeat of him were i to be broken alive on the wheel afterwards argant hides trembling behind scapin sir the father of octave is a brave man and perhaps he will not be afraid of you ah will he not s blood s death if he were here i would in a moment run my sword through his body seeing argant who is that man he's not the man sir he's not the man is he one of his friends no sir on the contrary he is his greatest enemy his greatest enemy yes ha <laughs> ha zounds i am delighted at it to argant you are an enemy of that scoundrel argant are you yes yes i assure you that it is so sylvestre shaking argant's hand roughly shake hands shake hands i give you my word i swear upon my honour and by the sword i wear by all the oaths i can take that before the day is over i shall have delivered you of that rascally knave of that scoundrel argant trust me but sir violent deeds are not allowed in this country i don't care and i have nothing to lose he will certainly take his precautions he has relations friends servants who will take his part against you blood and thunder it is all i ask all i ask drawing his sword ah's death 
Ah's blood! Why can I not meet him at this very moment with all these relations and friends of his? If he would only appear before me, surrounded by a score of them, why do they not fall upon me, arms and hand? Standing upon his guard. What? You villains? You dare to attack me? Now's death. Kill and slay. He lunges out on all sides, as if he were fighting many people at once. No quarter. Lay on, thrust, firm, again, eye and foot. Ah, knaves, ah, rascals. Ah, you shall have a taste of it. I'll give you your fill. Come on, you rabble, come on. That's what you want. You there. You shall have your fill of it, I say. Stick to it, you brutes. Stick to it. Now then, Perry. Now then, you. Turning towards Argonde and Scapin. Perry this. Perry. You draw back. Stand for man's death. What? Uh, never flinch, I say. Sir, we have nothing to do with it. That will teach you to trifle with me. Scene 10. Argonde, Scapin. Well, sir, you see how many people are killed for two hundred pistoles. Now I wish you a good morning. Argonde, all trembling. Scapin. What do you say? I will give the two hundred pistoles. Oh, I am very glad of it, for your sake. Let us go to him. I have them with me. Better give them to me. You must not, for your honor, appear in this business now that you have passed for another. And besides, I should be afraid that he would ask you for more if he knew who you are. True. Still, I should be glad to see to whom I give my money. Do you mistrust me, then? Oh, no. But... Soon, sir. Either I am a thief or an honest man, one or the other. Do you think I would deceive you, and that in all this I have any other interest at heart than yours and that of my master, whom you want to take into your family? If I have not all your confidence, I will have no more to do with all this, and you can look out for somebody else to get you out of the mess. Here, then. No, sir. Do not trust your money to me. I would rather you trusted another with your message. Ah, me. Here, take it. No, no, I tell you. Do not trust me. Who knows if I do not want to steal your money from you? Take it, I tell you. And don't force me to ask you again. However, mind you have an acknowledgment from him. <laughs> Trust me, he hasn't to do with an idiot. I will go home and wait for you. I shall be sure to go. Alone? <laughs> that one's all right. Now for the other. Ah, here he is. They are sent one after the other to fall into my net. <laughs> Scene 11. Géronte, Scapin. Scapin, affecting not to see Géronte. Oh, heaven! Oh, unforeseen misfortune! Oh, unfortunate father! Poor Géronte! What will you do? Géronte, aside. What is he saying there with that doleful face? Can no one tell me where to find Mr. Gironde? What is the matter, Scapin? Scapin, running about on the stage and still affecting not to see or hear Gironde. Where could I meet him to tell him of this misfortune? Gironde, stopping Scapin. What is the matter? Scapin, as before, in vain i run everywhere to meet him i cannot find him here i am he must have hidden himself in some place which nobody can guess ho oh, i say are you blind can't you see me ah sir it is impossible to find you i have been near you for the last half hour what is it all about sir well your son sir well my son 
has met with the strangest misfortune you ever heard of what is it this afternoon i found him looking very sad about something which you had said to him and in which you had very improperly mixed my name while trying to dissipate his sorrow we went and walked about in the harbour there among other things was to be seen a turkish galley a young turk with a gentlemanly look about him invited us to go in and held out his hand to us <laughs> we went in he was most civil to us gave us some lunch with the most excellent fruit and the best wine you have ever seen what is there so sad about all this <sighs> wait a little it is coming whilst we were eating the galley left the harbour and when in the open sea the turk made me go down into a boat and sent me to tell you that unless you sent by me five hundred crowns he would take your son prisoner to algiers what five hundred crowns yes sir and moreover he only gave me two hours to find them in ah this scoundrel of a turk to murder me in that fashion it is for you sir to see quickly about the means of saving from slavery a son whom you love so tenderly what the deuce did he want to go in that galley for he had no idea of what would happen go scapin go quickly and tell that turk that i shall send the police after him the police in the open sea <laughs> are you joking what the deuce did he want to go in that galley for a cruel destiny will sometimes lead people listen scapin you must act in this the part of a faithful servant uh how sir you must go and tell that turk that he must send me back my son and that you will take his place until i have found the sum he asks ah oh, sir do you know what you are saying do you fancy that that turk will be foolish enough to receive a poor wretch like me in your son's stead what the deuce did he want to go in that galley for he could not foresee his misfortune however sir remember that he has given me only two hours you say that he asks five hundred crowns five hundred crowns has he no conscience <laughs> conscience in a turk does he understand what five hundred crowns are yes sir he knows that five hundred crowns are one thousand five hundred francs does the scoundrel think that one thousand five hundred francs are to be found in the gutter <laughs> such people will never listen to reason but what the deuce did he want to go in that galley for oh what a waste of words leave the galley alone remember that time presses and that you are running the risk of losing your son for ever alas my poor master perhaps i shall never see you again and that at this very moment whilst i am speaking to you they are taking you away to make a slave of you in algiers <laughs> but heaven is my witness that i did all i could and that if you are not brought back it is all owing to the want of love of your father wait a minute scapin i will go and fetch that sum of money be quick then for i am afraid of not being in time you said four hundred crowns did you not no five hundred crowns five hundred crowns yes what the deuce did he want to go in that galley for quite right but be quick could he not have chosen another walk it is true but act promptly 
cursed galley scapin aside oh, that galley sticks in his throat here scapin i had forgotten that i have just received the sum in gold and i had no idea it would so soon be wrenched from me taking his purse out of his pocket and making as if he were giving it to scapin but mind you tell the turk that he's a scoundrel scapin holding out his hand yes geronte as above an infamous wretch scapin still holding out his hand yes geronte as above a man without conscience a thief leave that to me geronte as above that all right geronte as above and that if ever i catch him he will pay for it yes geronte putting back the purse in his pocket go go quickly and fetch my son scapin running after him hello sir well and the money did i not give it to you no indeed you put it back in your pocket ha it is grief that troubles my mind so i see what the deuce did he want to go in that galley for ah oh, cursed galley scoundrel of a turk may the devil take you scapin alone <sighs> he can't get over the five hundred crowns i wrench from him but he has not yet done with me and i will make him pay in a different money his imposture about me to his son scene twelve octave leandre scapin well scapin have your plans been successful have you done anything towards alleviating my sorrow scapin to octave here are two hundred pistoles i have got from your father oh how happy you make me scapin to leandre but i could do nothing for you leandre going away then i must die sir for i could not live without zerbinet hello stop stop my goodness how quick you are what can become of me there there i have all you want ah you bring me back to life again but i give it you only on one condition which is that you will allow me to revenge myself a little on your father for the trick he has played me you may do as you please you promise it to me before witnesses yes there take these five hundred crowns ah oh, i will go at once and buy her whom i adore end of act two act three of the impostures of scapin by moliere translated by charles heron wall this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org act three scene one zerbinet hyacinta scapin silvestre yes your lovers have decided that you should be together and we are acting according to their orders hyacinta to zerbinet such an order has nothing in it but what is pleasant to me i receive such a companion with joy and it will not be my fault if the friendship which exists between those we love does not exist also between us two i accept the offer and i am not one to draw back when friendship is asked of me and when it is love that is asked of you ah love is a different thing one runs more risk and i feel less determined you are determined enough against my master and yet what he has just done for you ought to give you confidence enough to respond to his love as you should as yet i only half trust him and what he has just done is not sufficient to reassure me i am of a happy disposition and i am very fond of fun it is true 
but though i laugh i am serious about many things and your master will find himself deceived if he thinks that it is sufficient for him to have bought me for me to be altogether his he will have to give something else besides money and for me to answer to his love as he wishes me he must give me his word with an accompaniment of certain little ceremonies which are thought indispensable it is so he understands this matter he only wants you as his wife and i am not a man to have mixed in this business if he had meant anything else i believe it since you say so but uh, i foresee certain difficulties with the father we shall find a way of settling that hyacintha to zerbinet the similarity of our fate ought to strengthen the tie of friendship between us we are both subject to the same fears both exposed to the same misfortune you have this advantage at least that you know who your parents are and that sure of their help when you wish to make them known you can secure your happiness by obtaining a consent to the marriage you have contracted but i on the contrary have no such hope to fall back upon and the position i am in is little calculated to satisfy the wishes of a father whose whole care is money that is true but you have this in your favour that the one you love is under no temptation of contracting another marriage a change in a lover's heart is not what we should fear the most we may justly rely on our own power to keep the conquest we have made but what i particularly dread is the power of the fathers for we cannot expect to see them moved by our merit alas why must the course of true love never run smooth how sweet it would be to love with no link wanting in those chains which unite two hearts how mistaken you are about this security in love forms a very unpleasant calm constant happiness becomes wearisome we want ups and downs in life and the difficulties which generally beset our path in this world revive us and increase our sense of pleasure do tell us scapa all about that stratagem of yours which i was told is so very amusing and how you managed to get some money out of your old miser you know that the trouble of telling me something amusing is not lost upon me and that i will repay those who take the trouble by the pleasure it gives me silvestre here will do that as well as i i am nursing in my heart a certain little scheme of revenge which i mean to enjoy thoroughly why do you recklessly engage in enterprises that may bring you into trouble i delight in dangerous enterprises as i told you already you would give up the idea you have if you would listen to me i prefer listening to myself why the deuce do you engage in such a business why the deuce do you trouble yourself about it it is because i can see that you will without necessity bring a storm of blows upon yourself ah oh, well it will be on my shoulders and not on yours it is true that you are master of your own shoulders and at liberty to dispose of them as you please such dangers never stop me and i hate those fearful hearts which by dint of thinking of what may happen never undertake anything zerbinet to scapin but we shall want you oh yes but i shall soon be with you again it shall never be said that a man has with impunity put me into a position of betraying myself and of revealing secrets which it were better should not be known scene two geronte scapin well scapin and how have we succeeded about my son's mischance your son is safe sir but you now run the greatest danger imaginable and i sincerely wish you were safe in your house how is that while i am speaking to you there are people who are looking out for you everywhere for me yes but who <laughs> the brother of that young girl whom octave has married 
he thinks that you are trying to break off that match because you intend to give to your daughter the place she occupies in the heart of octave and he has resolved to wreak his vengeance upon you all his friends men of the sort like himself are looking out for you and are seeking you everywhere i have met with scores here and there soldiers of his company who question every one they meet and occupy in companies all the thoroughfares leading to your house so that you cannot go home either to the right or the left without falling into their hands what can i do my dear scapin <laughs> i am sure i don't know sir it is an unpleasant business i tremble for you from head to foot and wait a moment scapin goes to see in the back of the stage if there is anybody coming well scapin coming back no no this is nothing could you not find out some means of saving me i can indeed think of one but i should run the risk of a sound beating <gasps> scapin show yourself a devoted servant do not forsake me i pray you i will do what i can i feel for you a tenderness which renders it impossible for me to leave you without help be sure that i will reward you for it scapin and i promise you this coat of mine when it is a little more worn wait a minute i have just thought at the proper moment of the very thing to save you you must get into this sack and i Geronte, thinking he sees somebody <gasps> no 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 tis nobody as i was saying you must get in here and must be very careful not to stir i will put you on my shoulders and carry you like a bundle of something or other i shall thus be able to take you through your enemies and see you safe into your house when there we will barricade the door and send for help a very good idea the best possible you will see aside <laughs> you shall pay me for that lie what i only say that your enemies will be finely caught get in right to the bottom and above all things be careful not to show yourself and not to move whatever may happen you may trust me to keep still hide yourself here comes one of the bullies he is looking for you altering his voice but i shall not have the pleasure to kill this gironde and one will not in charity show me where is he do not stir pardi i will find him if he lied in the middle of the earth do not show yourself oh you man with the zack sir i will give thee a pound if thou wilt tell me where this gironde is you are looking for mr gironde yes that i am and on what business sir for what business yes i will pardi trash him with one stick to dead oh sir people like him are not thrashed with sticks and he is not a man to be treated so what this fop of a geronde this prude this cat mr geronde sir is neither a fop a brute nor a cad and you ought if you please to speak differently what you speak so mighty with me i am defending as i ought an honourable man who is maligned are you one friend of this gironde yes sir i am aha you are one friend of him that is good luck beating the sack several times with his stick here is what i give you for him calling out as if he received the beating Oh, 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 sir, oh, 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 sir, gently, oh, pray, oh, 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 there, bear him that for me, good pie. Oh, oh the wretch, oh, oh, Geronte, looking out. <gasps> Skipper, I can bear it no longer. Oh, sir, 
i am bruised all over and my shoulders are as sore as can be how it was on mine he laid his stick i beg your pardon sir it was on my back what do you mean i am sure i felt the blows and feel them still no i tell you it was only the end of his stick that reached your shoulders you should have gone a little farther back then to spare me and scapin pushing Geron's head back into the sack take care here is another man who looks like a foreigner friend me run like one dutchman and me not find all the day this dreadful Geronde. hide yourself well tell me you sir gentleman if you please know you not where is this Geronde? what me look for uh, no sir i do not know where Geronde is tell me truthful me not want much with him only to give him one dozen ploughs with a stick and two or three runs with a sword through his chest i assure you sir i do not know where he is it seems me i see some things shake in that sack excuse me sir i be sure there is some sink or other in that sack not at all sir me should like to give one plough of the sort in that sack ah oh, sir beware pray you of doing so but show me then what to be there gently sir why gently you have nothing to do with what i am carrying and i but i will see you shall not see ah what trifling it is some clothes of mine show me them i tell you i will not you will not no i make you feel this stick upon the shoulders i don't care ah you will post striking the sack and calling out as if he were beaten oh, 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 oh oh sir good-bye that is one little lesson teach you to speak so insolent ah oh, plague the crazy jabra Geronte oh. looking out of the sack <gasps> all my bones are broken oh, i'm dying why the deuce do they strike on my back scapin pushing his head back into the bag take care i see half a dozen soldiers coming together imitating the voices of several people now we must discover Geronde. let us look everywhere carefully we must spare no trouble scour the town and not forget one single spot let us search on all sides which way shall we go let us go that way no this on the left no on the right no yes hide yourself well ah here is his servant i say you rascal you must tell us where your master is speak be quick at once make haste now ah, gentlemen one moment Geronte looks quietly out of the bag and sees scapin's trick if you do not tell us at once where your master is we will shower a rain of blows on your back i had rather suffer anything than tell you where my master is very well we will cudgel you soundly do as you please you want to be beaten then i will never betray my master oh you will have it there <laughs> as he is going to strike Geronte gets out of the bag and scapin runs away Geronte alone <sighs> infamous wretch i rascal scoundrel it is thus that you murder me scene three zerbinette geronte zerbinette laughing without seeing geronte ah <laughs> really come and breathe a little Geronte aside not seeing zerbinette i will make you pay for it zerbinette not seeing Geronte. 
<laughs> what an amusing story. Oh, what a good dupe that old man is. This is no matter for laughter, and you have no business to laugh at it. Why? What do you mean, sir? I mean to say that you ought not to laugh at me. Laugh at you? Yes. How? Who is thinking of laughing at you? Why do you come and laugh in my face? Oh, this has nothing to do with you. I'm only laughing with myself at the remembrance of a story which has just been told me. <laughs> the most amusing story in the world. I don't know if it is because I am interested in the matter, but I have never heard anything so absurd as the trick that has just been played by a son to his father to get some money out of him. By a son to his father to get some money out of him? Yes. And if you are at all desirous of hearing how it was done, I will tell you the whole affair. I have a natural longing for imparting to others the funny things I know. Pray tell me that story. Willingly. I shall not risk much by telling it you, for it is an adventure which is not likely to remain secret long. Fate placed me among one of those bands of people who are called gypsies, and who, tramping from province to province, tell you your fortune, and do many other things besides. When we came to this town I met a young man who, on seeing me, fell in love with me. From that moment he followed me everywhere, and, like all young men, he imagined that he had but to speak, and things would go on as he liked. But he met with a pride which forced him to think twice. He spoke of his love to the people in whose power I was, and found them ready to give me up for a certain sum of money. But the sad part of the business was that my lover found himself exactly in the same condition as most young men of good family, that is, without any money at all. His father, although rich, is the veriest old skinflint and greatest miser you have ever heard of. Wait a moment, what is his name? I don't remember it. Can't you help me? Can't you name someone in this town who is known to be the most hard-fisted old miser in the place? No. There is in his name some Ron... Ronte or... Oronte... No, J. Geronte. Yes, Geronte. That's my miser's name. I have it now. It is the old churl, I mean. Well... To come back to our story, our people wished to leave this town today, and my lover would have lost me through his lack of money if, in order to wrench some out of his father, he had not made use of a clever servant he has. As for that servant's name, I remember it very well. His name is Scapin. Oh, he is a most wonderful man and deserves the highest praise. Geronte, aside. <laughs> the rich but just listen to the plan he adopted to take in his tube ah <laughs> i can't think of it without laughing heartily <laughs> he went to that old screw <laughs> and told him that while he was walking about the harbour with his son <laughs> they noticed the turkish galley that a young Turk had invited them to come in and see it, that he had given them some lunch, <laughs> and that, while they were at table, the galley had gone into the open sea, that the Turk had sent him alone back, with the express order to say to him that, unless he sent him five hundred crowns, he would take his son to be a slave in Algiers. <laughs> You may imagine our miser, our stingy old commergen, in the greatest anguish, struggling between his love for his son and his love for his money. Those five hundred crowns that are asked of him are five hundred dagger thrusts. <laughs> he can't bring his mind to tear out, as it were, this sum from his heart, 
and his anguish makes him think of the most ridiculous means to find money for his son's ransom ah oh. <laughs> he wants to send the police into the open sea after the turk's galley <laughs> he asks his servant to take the place of his son till he has found the money to pay for him money he has no intention of giving <laughs> he yields up to make the five hundred crowns three or four old suits which are not worth thirty <laughs> the servant shows him each time how absurd is what he proposes and each reflection of the old fellow is accompanied by an agonizing but what the deuce did he want to go in that galley for ah oh, cursed galley ah oh, scoundrel of a turk <laughs> at last after many hesitations after having sighed and groaned for a long time but it seems to me that my story does not make you laugh what do you say to it what i say that the young man is a scoundrel a good-for-nothing fellow who will be punished by his father for the trick he has played him that the gypsy girl is a bold impudent hussy to come and insult a man of honour who will give her what she deserves for coming here to debauch the sons of good families and that the servant is an infamous wretch whom Gironde will take care to have hung before tomorrow is over. Scene four, Zerbinet, Sylvestre. Where are you running away to? Do you know that man you were speaking to is your lover's father? I have just begun to suspect that it was so. Oh, and i related to him his own story without knowing who he was what do you mean by his story yes i was so full of that story that i longed to tell it to somebody but what does it matter so much the worse for him i do not see that things can be made either better or worse you must have been in a great hurry to chatter and it is indiscretion indeed not to keep silent on your own affairs Oh, he would have heard it from somebody else. Scene 5. Argante, Zerbinet, Silvestre. Argante behind the scenes. Hello, Silvestre. Silvestre to Zerbinet. Go in there, my master is calling me. Scene 6. Argante, Silvestre. So you agreed, you rascals. You agreed, Scapine, you and my son to cheat me out of my money and you think that i am going to bear it patiently upon my word sir if scapin is deceiving you it is none of my doing i assure you that i have nothing whatever to do with it we shall see you rascal we shall see and i am not going to be made a fool of for nothing scene seven Gironde, argante sylvestre ah mr argant you see me in the greatest trouble and i am in the greatest sorrow this rascal scapin has got five hundred crowns out of me yes and this same rascal scapin two hundred pistoles out of me he was not satisfied with getting those five hundred crowns but treated me besides in a manner i am ashamed to speak of but he shall pay me for it i shall have him punished for the trick he has played me and i mean to make an example of him Silvestre aside may heaven grant that i do not catch my share of all this but mr argant this is not all and misfortunes as you know never come alone i was looking forward to the happiness of to-day seeing my daughter who was everything to me and i have just heard that she left her antum a long while since and there is a every reason to suppose that the ship was wrecked and that she is lost to me for ever but why did you keep her in Tarentum instead of enjoying the happiness of having her with you? 
I had my reasons for it. Some family interests forced me till now to keep my second marriage secret. But what do I see? Scene 8. Argonde, Gérante, Nérine, Sylvestre. What? You here, Nérine? Nérine, on her knees before Gérante. Ah, Mr. Bandolph, how... Call me Gérante, and do not use the other name any more. The reasons which forced me to take it at Tarentum exist no longer. Alas, what sorrow that change of name has caused us. What troubles and difficulties in trying to find you out. And where are my daughter and her mother? Your daughter, sir, is not far from here. But before I go to fetch her, I must ask you to forgive me for having married her because of the forsaken state we found ourselves in when we had no longer any hope of meeting you. My daughter is married? Yes, sir. And to whom? To a young man called Octave, the son of a certain Mr. Argant. Oh, heaven. What an extraordinary coincidence. Take us quickly where she is. You have but to come into this house. Go in first. Follow me, follow me, Mr. Argant. Sylvestre, alone. Well. Wow. This is a strange affair. Scene 9. Scapin, Sylvestre. Well, Sylvestre, what are our people doing? I have two things to tell you. One is that Octave is all right. Our Hyacintha is, it seems, the daughter of Gerante, and chance has brought to pass what the wisdom of the fathers had decided. The other, that the old men threaten you with the greatest punishments, particularly Mr. Gerant. Oh, that's nothing. Threats have never done me any harm as yet. They are but clouds which pass away far above our heads. You had better take care. The sons may get reconciled to their fathers and leave you in the lurch. Leave that to me. I shall find the means of soothing their anger and... Go away. I see them coming. Scene 10. Gérante, Argante, Hyacinta, Zerbinette, Nérine, Sylvestre. Come, my daughter, come to my house. My happiness would be perfect if your mother had been with you. Here is Octave coming, just at the right time. Scene 11. Argante, Gérante, Octave, Hyacinta, Zerbinette, Nérine, Sylvestre. Come, my son. Come and rejoice with us about the happiness of your marriage. Heaven? No, father. All your proposals for marriage are useless. I must be open with you. And you have been told how I am engaged. Yes, but what you do not know... I know all I care to know. I mean to say that the daughter of Monsieur Gerant... The daughter of Monsieur Gerant will never be anything to me. It is she who... Octave to Gérante. You need not go on, sir. I hope you will forgive me, but I shall abide by my resolution. Sylvestre to Octave. Listen. Be silent. I will listen to nothing. Argant to Octave. Your wife. No, father. I would rather die than lose my dear Hyacinta. Crossing the theatre and placing himself by Hyacinta. Yes. All you would do is useless. This is the one to whom my heart is engaged. I will have no other wife. Well, she it is whom we give you. What a madcap! You are never to listen to anything but your own foolish whim. Hyacinta, showing Gérante. Yes, Octave. This is my father, whom I have found again. And all our troubles are over. Let us go home. We shall talk more comfortably at home. Hyacinta, showing Zerbinette. Ah, oh, father, I beg of you the favour not to part me from this charming young lady. She has noble qualities, which will be sure to make you like her when you know her. What? 
do you wish me to take to my house a girl with whom your brother is in love and who told me to my face so many insulting things pray forgive me sir i should not have spoken in that way if i had known who you were and i only knew you by reputation by reputation what do you mean father i can answer for it that she is most virtuous and that the love my brother has for her is pure it is all very well you would try now to persuade me to marry my son to her a stranger a street girl scene twelve argante gironde leandre octave hyacinta zerbinette nerine sylvestre my father you must no longer say that i love a stranger without birth or wealth those from whom i bought her have just told me that she belongs to an honest family in this town they stole her away when she was four years old and here is a bracelet which they gave me and which will help me to discover her family ah to judge by this bracelet this is my daughter whom i lost when she was four years old your daughter yes i see she is my daughter i know all her features again my dear child oh what wonderful events scene thirteen argante gironde leandre octave hyacinta zerbinette nerine sylvestre karl ah gentlemen a most sad accident has just taken place what is it poor skepin he is a rascal whom i shall see hung alas sir you will not have that trouble as he was passing near a building a bricklayer's hammer fell on his head and broke his skull leaving his brain exposed he is dying and he has asked to be brought in here to speak to you before he dies scene fourteen argante gironde leandre octave hyacinta zerbinette nerine sylvestre karl scapin scapin brought in by some men his head wrapped up as if he were wounded oh gentlemen you see me oh you see me in a sad state oh i would not die without coming to ask forgiveness of all those i may have offended oh, yes gentlemen before i give up the ghost i beseech you to forgive me all i have done amiss and particularly mr argant and mr gironde oh, 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 oh i forgive you die in peace scapin scapin to gironde it is you sir i have offended the most because of the beating with the cudgel which i leave that alone i feel in dying an inconceivable grief for the beating which i ah me be silent that unfortunate beating that i gave be silent i tell you i forgive you everything alas how good you are but is it really with all your heart that you forgive me the beating which i yes yes don't mention it i forgive you everything you are punished ah sir how much better i feel for your kind words yes i forgive you but on one condition that you die how sir i retract my words if you recover oh all my pains are coming back monsieur gironde let us forgive him without any condition for we are all so happy well be it so let us go to supper and talk of our happiness and you take me to the end of the table it is there i will await death end of act three 
End of The Impostures of Scapin by Moliere. Translated by Charles Heron Wall.